All right, fantastic. Welcome to our panel this afternoon. This panel is all about uh, network programmability, APIs for the network, and that kind of journey of going from doing networking in the way that you've always approached it into how you introduce some of the open tools, how you work with APIs, and how you get started on this journey around network programmability. So thank you guys very much for coming and being here. I want to start off by just introducing our panel. I am uh, absolutely uh, ecstatic to have this panel on stage and we have a great set of different perspectives, different experiences, enterprise, service provider, data center, um, the whole gamut of networking and um, lots of good conversation will ensue, I'm sure. So um, I'll start at the end with uh, Stuart Clark. Stuart's one of our DevNet developer advocates. It's focused entirely on network automation. Next, we've got um, Shelly Kadora. She is a principal engineer with Cisco, and um, she works in our service provider business group currently. Uh, next, we've got Denise Fish Fishburn. She is a routing and switching design and deploy expert, and she really is into seeing the power of what working together with DevNet and APIs can, can empower. And then we have Jason Edelman, founder of Network to Code, and also the author of one of O'Reilly's latest books, Network Programmability and Automation. And then we have Matthias Perkop. So he cool. um, works at a, a, a um, he's a founder of a community-led ISP while he was still in his teens. Wow, that's wow. pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and designed data centers at Google, and then now is a principal architect at Natalik, a company providing Cisco-based solutions on a global basis. Natalik. Oh, Natalik, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Natalik. No, that's fine. <laughs> thank you, I knew I would mess something up. So thank you guys all for being here, super excited. Um, we're going to go through a couple different things, but I want to start with, Everyone has gone through the transition of starting to learn about APIs for the network, how to use them, how you get started on this journey. And I'd really just like to hear from each one of you, how did you get started? Like what were some of the first ways that you encountered it? How you just, what prompted you to do it? What did you learn along the way? Matthias, you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. So in terms of the, when I started with the open source, that was in my teens when we were building the network. We didn't have the money, obviously, so we were all building the network on a Linux. So uh, that was my first sort of steps in the open source, and that was the short path down to the APIs. Yeah. That was around year 2003, 2004. Um, and obviously, you know, getting more introduced into the open source software com uh, community, you know, sharing the, uh, the code and just adding the code. And then from that, move into the APIs. I didn't really start to automate straight away with all the nice tools which we have nowadays, you know, Ansible and all this stuff. But uh, it was more about like programming stuff, uh, Python. And that was about 2004, I think. Uh, that was with the tools like Expect. So it was very uh, Kubernetes automation, you know, it wasn't yeah. not that nice and like nowadays. Now a lot more tools and, and yeah, APIs exactly. And then I think you know most most of the APIs I started using it was in my time in Google. That was like oh, first big introduction cool. in, into the into the APIs. Jason, how about you? Sure. So my background actually in network automation started around like 2012 or 13, and it actually coincides with the beginning of DevNet. So I was working for a Cisco partner. We had access to something called Cisco One PK. Yeah. And it was one of the first SDKs that can be used to program against a switch or a router. And as we today we have iPhone SDKs, SDKs for Android writing phone apps. And here it was it was the emergence of trying to use one PK, the Cisco SDK, to program in Python, Java, and C. And at the time, you know, I hadn't programmed in well over a decade, and even that was, you know, was in uh, was in high school. So I ended up going out to honestly pay people at my old university. And uh, that sort of you know, started me on, on my path to automation using 1PK to automate again switches. Around the same time in 2013 and 14, I had demos of things like Puppet and Ansible in the network space. And so like aha moments really just went off in terms of uh, you know, a lot of focus around architecture and design for, for decades. But you know, really, even me personally, I was walking away from clients once things were installed. And it was just you know seeing the power of what could be done with automation and help you know clients day to day. Yeah, that really started myself down the path of network automation and really started network to code as well. Nice. 
Nice. Well, I'm a complete newbie, actually. I'm a complete newbie to. So we're to, here no, for the beginning. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for the scarf. No. Um, I think that um, so from an automation perspective, so I kind of sort of represent a lot of the people that I feel are networking people that were very kind of sort of um, we have fear, right? I've seen a lot of people with fear about um, automation and stuff like that, but it's, you know, it's approach to network automation in our network. And, and for me, really, it's like, well, if you wanted to find automation, okay, so fine, you know, tickle scripts, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. EEM. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so um, I'm in CPOC, so we had tickle scripts that we wrote like 19 years ago, 18 years ago to, um, to just do all kinds of stuff for us for network automation. Yep, I think that's a great point. It's not, it's not as a new concept, but we've got new tooling, new ways of interacting, new protocols that we can work with that maybe make it more accessible well, and easier to do. Well, it's the power of it, yeah. right? We, we've always been doing no network automation, yeah. even as hardcore routing people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but yeah, so great. tickle scripts and just that kind of fun stuff and yeah. EEM was my beginning. And it's, cool. I got to say, it's such an honor to be up here with these people because <laughs> Um, I'm early in my journey and I get to learn from all of you. Cool. Shelly, how about you? So I joined Cisco a long time ago as a test engineer and the internship that I had had just prior to that was testing voicemail. You guys remember that? So ah. I would spend my days an entire summer picking up a handset <laughs> and going beep, boop, <laughs> boop, 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 <laughs> and putting it down and doing it again. So when I got to Cisco and people were like, oh, here's a CLI, I thought I was already automated. You know, like yeah. I didn't have to physically move something to do my testing. Um, but automation really started for me with these little irritating problems. Like I had a comm server that there was one port that was flaky on, and I'd have to manually go clear it before I could telnet. So I wrote a script that just would go, and instead of telnetting, would first go clear that line five times and then telnet in for me. Uh. And that to me is an example of using automation to sort of bootstrap you into a manual task. Yep. But over time, what I discovered, and I think this is very um, natural to people who start off in test, is then you want to automate your testing. So, yep. you know, if I get four images a week and I need to test in multicast that a certain SG entry is populated when I do four things, I don't want to be doing that four times every week. If at yep. any point that I can automate that, it saves me time. It also, what's really important is it makes it auditable. Instead of my boss coming to me and saying, right. well, hey, did you test that version? And me saying, sure. I can actually point to it and say, and here was the output. So That's a great point. So my background, I come more from the software developer side. Like that's my background. Where, and I started off in doing a lot of software development, CICD, automated testing, all those things. And the one of the drivers when that all came into software was the audit trail of like yeah. being able to know like what happened and report back on that. I think that's a really important aspect. Stuart. Hi. Um, so before I joined DevNet, I used to work in a um, organization at Cisco and we had Cisco's second largest global network. And we're building this thing out over a period of time. And we didn't realize how big it was going to be. Originally it started out as going to be 15 to 20 sites and then it soon grew into 35. And as things start to spiral out of control, I always used to pride myself as being that CLI guy, mm -hmm. you know, and I will admit back then I was, I was kind of a little arrogant. I actually thought that my CLI skills were better than automation, but I thought that I was faster than automation. <laughs> and that's why I didn't learn it. And I kind of shied away from it. But thinking back now, I, I didn't learn it because there's a, a part of me that thought I maybe couldn't do it and I was a little afraid. And so I'm working next to this guy who used to sit next to me at the office back in London and terrific guy. And he was fantastic at C, and he was fantastic at Python. And I watched him do some automation next to me, and he was, he was really, really good at it. And I asked him if he would show me some bits and pieces of, of how to get started. And that's really how I got started. And he said to me one day, you know, we should really automate this network. We should really go into this because it'll make our job so much easier. And we were looking at it from a build perspective at that point, because we were under a lot of pressure to build a, a data center when we've got you know guys on site and that's how it really started for us was building our, our deployment in automation so we can when the data center team are on site they're only there for three days we can turn up this whole big infrastructure really quickly 
and they can get off site because for every hour they're there, that's costing us money. Mm -hmm. And we need to get them in and out as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and that's really how it all started for me. That's a great point. I like that story about the guy next to you and having that sort of guiding um, yeah. influence. Yeah. And you know, I think that's some of what we're trying to do here in the DevNet zone, right? Like the, the team that I lead within DevNet is our developer advocates who should be, if you don't have someone next to you at your company, they can be that sort of virtual or community-led person that can lead you into it. Um, so what are some of the things that you guys have seen that DevNet might do to help, that, that's doing to help kind of further that journey along, some of that learning? Jason? Yeah, yeah I'll, okay. I'll take that one. Yep. So day-to-day, you, -day, you know, I'm working with a lot of different clients and you know, the first thing that we always see is getting access to devices to start automating. And you know, right now, to testing an API on a device, you know, traditionally you needed a lab to do that. And you know, we've used DevNet you know, quite a bit for using the always-on devices right, to test even if it's a Nexus 9K API. You know, DNA Center, you know, brand new, their, their APIs. So you know, from our standpoint, it's really just you know, first place to go. New device you know, for me or for the team. And if it's there, you know, we'll just test it because you know, it reduces the time to you know, procure, provision, load a VM up, whatever it is. So it's been you know, tremendous in terms of getting access to, to devices to start testing and using oh, APIs. Awesome, that's great. Matthias, yeah. did you have something to add? Uh, so, so what I find always helpful in DevNet are the basically the tracks, you know, they, where you can follow, yeah. and it just helps you to up, to upskill. That's what I'm finding most helpful, and something which I'm recommending to our clients, because I'm always saying like, you know, I wish I would have this like 10 years ago. So that's what I find very helpful about DevNet, cool. to be honest. And Stuart, as an advocate, are there some things you want to add to like? Yeah, sure. I think when we're creating the learning labs and the content, you have to take into consideration the, the, the types of people coming in. And you don't know the type of person that's coming in, so you have to kind of try to hit it from a lot of different angles. Because that person might be a, you know, a really senior network engineer, or they might be a junior network engineer, or they might be somebody who's in, say, for example, an SRE group who wants to learn about network automation. Because as we're opening the network up now, days to let other teams run automation against network devices. They're fantastic at programming, but they possibly don't understand the basics of sort of like the network infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So within the learning labs, you try to sort of curate that so it, it kind of starts to fit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's that's the that's the exciting you know time we're living in right now. You know, we're going through this transition where me, you know, with a network background, you know, I need to upskill in the software development, you know, yeah. just kind of like embrace the tools like CI, CD pipelines and the processes, how to actually approach the development of the software. And I think it's sort of like when you take it from the other way around, from the software development side, usually for these guys, they need to sort of understand how networking works. Yeah. So uh, I think it's, it's quite exciting, you know, the, the transition time right now we are living. That's great. So one of the things that um, you know we see as we work on the DevNet Zone and, and bring this content to Cisco Live is DevNet and, and Cisco are really opening up APIs across our portfolio. So data center, enterprise, service provider, collab, IoT, you know every part of the portfolio and up and down the stack at the controller level, at the device level. And part of having those APIs is that it makes it where you can work with you know, common DevOps tools, you can work with with open source tooling, you can work with different toolkits, you can program in the language of your choice. So I'd like to get a view from our panelists on, if you were kind of like, what tools are you really excited about learning right now? What tools are you working with right now? What would you recommend to the audience in terms of like, go check into this, or um, this is a great place to start with, you know, building that toolkit that kind of surrounds using the APIs. I think, so. I think I, I've started with Jason's book. Oh, with Jason's <laughs> book? Yeah, 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 I think. Right, I was about that. that. <laughs> you were about that. It, it was, it was I, I, I would highly recommend that, you know, that was a great starter for me uh, to sort of explore the tools like Git, for instance. You know, yeah. I wasn't very uh, much knowledgeable about the Git a couple years ago, but uh, that book helped, so that's, cool. that's my recommendation. Shelly, how about you? You know, it's really interesting because I started hardcore with the APIs was with 1PK, one, one yeah, you know, yeah. which was one of our really early SDKs, yeah. and I was super into that. Like, I love doing Python and coming up with applications. Um, I'm also working on YDK, which is another SDK we have around Yang models. But most recently, and the tool that's kind of surprised me the most, um, is uh, NSO, which is a Cisco tool, a network service orchestrator, which 
you know, I've been so into open source tools that I, you know, I was like, I'm not trying that. But when I did try it, I realized the value of what it does. And it doesn't, you know, whatever thing you use, you need something that provides a level of abstraction. Yes. And a, a platform or a tool that allows you to access the entire network. Yep. Because often if you're just writing code, you're writing code that talks to a single device. Um, but if you can use data models and you can talk to many devices through the same platform, that's what starts to really accelerate you in terms of yeah. um, doing system-wide automation and not just clear the clear the yeah. console right. you know, before so I you, tell them. You that. mentioned um, YDK and yeah. Yang, and just in case we have people who are who don't know, do you want to give a quick intro into what is Yang, what is RustConf, what is NetConf? Sure. So I think of Yang as um, it, it stands for yet another next gen. <laughs> um, and then you get to decide what it is. Uh, but it's basically a data modeling language standardized in the IETF. My mental image for it is a cookie cutter. Okay, so what it if you look at a cookie cutter, it defines what the shape of the cookie will be. Hmm. But it doesn't actually tell you, are there going to be chocolate chips or oatmeal or what kind of cookie it's going to be or what kind of icing will be on it. <laughs> in order to do that, you need to stamp it out and make a cookie. And the cookie will be JSON or XML um, or some other format that encodes uh, the data that you described in your cookie cutter. So my cookie cutter says, the Yang model says, this is what data I have available. And here's how it's structured. Here's a tree structure. Um, and then the actual data itself that a device will send you would be the XML content of, for example, a NetConf um, message. The difference between something like NetConf and RESTConf is really just in the transport, right? So NetConf is um, an SSH session uh, to, the, to the box. RESTConf is a REST API to the box. Underneath, now it could be JSON or XML, but the, the data and how it's modeled is the same because you have the same Yang model that's your cookie cutter. You stamp out different cookies and then you ship them off either in awesome. uh, SSH or HTML. Yeah, thank you, that was great. We've mentioned a couple different Cisco platforms, so I'm interested to just hear which Cisco APIs are each of you really working with or trying to learn about? You know, where are you on that? Jason, you want to start? Sure, yeah, m most recently I've been using iOS XC's APIs right now at NetConf and RESTConf. Right. And, you know, again, you know, it's, it's probably, uh, personally, and you know, I really do believe this, not just because I'm, I'm here you know, today, I think the most robust APIs on a on standalone networking devices you know, throughout the industry, being able to access the same the same data through two transport types, and even to uh, to build on uh, the example Shelley was saying around like that data, like for a concrete example, we can look at like VLANs as the example, and you can consume VLANs configuration or retrieving data through XML or JSON. But when you go to configure a VLAN, say VLAN, you know, 5,000 or 10,000, when you get an error on the CLI or an error through an API call, it's it's violating the Yang model, right? So just, you know, oftentimes we get caught up in a lot of the acronyms, but you may never actually consume Yang, but you just know good practices and good standards because otherwise you'll get CLI errors. But, you know, uh, and, and this is this is more easily seen using you know, modern APIs on iOS XE, yeah. and you know, great APIs, and uh, you know, it's, again. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cool, Matthias? Uh, I'm quite excited lately about the OpenConf, to be honest, okay. so uh, I've been doing some reading lately on the OpenConf. I I'm, I'm mm. find the most interesting part of the OpenConf, the telemetry, because that's what I was sort of always missing in the automation. There is no really any open model in terms of the how getting the telemetry from the devices, yeah. and I think, for me, telemetry will be quite important, quite important piece, you know, in the next few years. I think that's where we will see yep. uh, most most of the development. So yeah, open content. Cool. Definitely. And I'm gonna left turn there into we have so Shelly works pretty deeply with telemetry and streaming <laughs> telemetry. Do you want to like give us a view into some of the things that are going on there and what's important about that topic? Yeah, I, I think one question that people say is, well, should I do telemetry? You know, Google announced last year they were going to turn off SNMP in their networks and they were going to use telemetry instead. And so naturally people think, well, I, sh I should get involved in it. Um, and I, I will say that there's a couple things you should consider before that and maybe understanding just a little bit of the history would help. We did telemetry when um, we, were, we were working with large cloud service providers and they said, look, we need more data from the network, right? We're not getting the low level detail that we need and we're not getting it fast enough. So these folks were, um, a lot of them had tuned their networks, they followed all the SMP best practices that we published and they were getting down to about five minute intervals. 
And that was as, as low as they could go to pull things like interface statistics. They wanted to go lower, and then they were seeing us producing ever higher density platforms. Like we are shoving a lot of 100 gig e ports today on our largest XR platforms, right? right. They're like, well, I, I want to go lower, but you're giving me more ports. There's no way I'm going to go lower with SNMP. I need a new direction going forward. Yeah. So that was part of it, was a performance issue, was just being able to push off more data. And the second thing that came out was the need for data that is modeled, right? Yep. So, yeah. you know, when you do a show interface and look at all those statistics of bytes received and bytes sent, well, that is just a text dump. And I've written them, I know, you can do, you know, a lot of regular expressions and pluck out the data that you need, um, but it can be difficult. So they wanted um, a data model and they wanted to get it really fast. So you have to ask yourself, if you're looking at your monitoring system today, am I getting enough data? Do I, because I talk to some people who are like, you know what, we're doing SNMP at 20 minutes and I don't even know what to do with all that data. It's Enough. being stored yeah. and we dump it, so why would you shoot it to me 20 times faster? And I'm like, okay, maybe we don't want to do that. That's a great point. Uh, the only reason that maybe you would want to do it is that you want it modeled in a, in a Yang model that is the same modeling language you're using f for configuration because you're doing something like NetConf or RESTConf. Yeah. So those are the two primary drivers, I would say, for looking at that. I, I do think we're going to see a transition over time uh, because more and more people will need more and more data. Um, but if you're talking about right now today, think about those very carefully. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Stuart, what um, platforms are you working with right now? At the minute, I'm working with um, SD1. Uh, we started with SD1 on DevNet by putting out some really great content to help people with the programmability and, uh, um, and automation with SD1. SD1 has a, a really nice northbound API that you can pull all the data from and you can do, you know, you can push templates and push policies to it. So I started working with this and for me it kind of, it, it, it ticks two boxes. One, it gives me that kind of gratification of a network engineer because when I worked at a service provider and a managed service provider, there's a lot of common issues that I face which are now quite easily solved by using SD-WAN, but it also ticks that really nice programmability box. And I can use the API on SD-WAN and I can use Ansible and I've been working with some of the guys and doing demos with Ansible for, for those that like using Ansible. And then you can use Python, which you know is my language of choice. And then more recently, I've started using Golang as well. So I'm kind of hitting that for northbound API, but then we're looking at the integration with other things like Umbrella and, and NSO that you were speaking about as well, where you've got your legacy network and you can plug NSO into, uh, into SD-WAN as well to give that really big orchestration of both your kind of, you know, you know what we would consider you know, legacy now as a compared to the sort of the V-Edge devices you would find in SD-WAN. So for me, it, it's super exciting because there's so much API information that you can build there. Cool, fantastic. Um, so one of the things that I, I have seen in um, so my background as software developer and seeing the move towards DevOps and the coming together of Dev and Ops and sort of the breaking down of the silos there. And, and really now it's you know security, Dev and Ops and networking, right? And so there's this, how do we bring all these groups together, get everyone talking a common language, and then what all does that enable? And um, Fish, I know that you have recently started working in security quite a bit, and you're seeing some of that coming together. I just wanted to get some of your thoughts on you know, the possibilities there. Uh, yeah, so um, silos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's silo free in your, in your company? You're silo free? Do you have your own company? <laughs> no. Just him. Um, so, um, so I'm 53 years old, so I've been in the industry for a while. Um, I was originally a programmer, Fortran, don't hold that against me. Uh, C, C++, my favorite actually is Python, but my favorite's Python because it's the only one I know so far. And, um, but from a silo perspective, what I've seen is I've seen a lot of people um, there's always that fear, right? So for people who are, who's networking, like majorly entrenched in networking, okay? So, right, it's always security's fault, <laughs> right? It's always security's fault. And so we already have that silo mentality also as humans. And so I can see when it impacts y'all's networks. Um, just a, a quick example for anyone who's done IWAN, SD-WAN, I felt the best place to have the controller, the master controller, was actually in a server using the HA that's already there. And when I would tell somebody that, that I think that's where the best place it is to use it, 
um, they, I would see this look on their face and I'm like, oh great, you're siloed with your server people. They're like, yeah. If we put it in the server farm, then we can't touch it anymore, yeah. right? And so I will say that it's, it's been a passion for me for years and I still see that kind of sort of, um, you know, you were talking about teaching the people who are doing the programmability about networking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm really happy that you all are here. Um, for those of you who are like major DevNet, you know, automation people, please don't hate the networking people. They're just afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the people who are networking people, um, don't hate them. Um, and they may not know networking, but right. what I'm going to say is, is that I, I truly believe that it's our network, right? It's an open source approach to network automation. It's the automating of the network. Yep. So if we can come together with other experts and truly share our knowledge, I mean, it's all hail the packet, right? <laughs> Whether it's telemetry, no matter what it is, there's a packet that goes from one place to the other for your customer, your network. And automation is about, it's about efficiency, it's about scaling, it's about hoping that we can also, because of fat fingering and human error, right? All, all of it's to make the network better. Yep. And when people ask me, well, is your job going to go away? Well, no, because networks are just going to get more complicated and security is going to get more complicated. So I'm just going to say, you know, embrace it if you're network entrenched. Just start learning some things, find some people that you trust. That's why I'm here because of Stuart. <laughs> so I go to him and I'm like, okay, what do you think I should be learning? <laughs> right? What should I be learning? Because he's already been there. So instead of me starting with something that's that's older, right. go to somebody. Yeah. You know? That's and a great point. Like how the community can be there to kind of help you get started. It's and community. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's all for one, one for all, yeah. and we've got each other's backs. Yep. <laughs> and Mateus, I know you are working on, so you're at a Cisco partner, and you are working on skilling up some of your yeah. team, right? You're an architect who's looking at these new solutions and working to skill up some of your team on this. Yeah. What are some of the approaches you're using there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're doing that internally. Uh, we're doing, you know, we have a sort of multiple ways how to how to do the uh, internal upskilling. Uh, it actually reminds me what uh, what you said about like sharing the knowledge. You know, that's that's that, that's about that. And it's also with our clients. You know, what we found always most helpful thing is that we are entering as a partner as someone who is neutral like entering the room and saying like, okay, he, we, here we go, like security team, networking team, application team, and we have to sort of like start brainstorming together. That always helps because if the somebody is from those three persons is the initiator, it's usually the others who are sort of like worried, you know, and sort of yeah. be afraid that, you know, something's going to happen or somebody will be taking over their jobs. So that's what we found useful. But uh, internally, yeah, we're doing the like uh, evening workshops inside, yeah, like internally in our company. We're uh, organizing meetups. Uh, yeah. Jason was in there. Uh, Stuart was presenting. So in London, we have a That's we have great. a meetups. Uh, I think you know Chilla should go and yes. <laughs> swap with me the seat. Yeah. Um, and uh, just you know writing the blogs. We have a many great guys uh, who's who's writing the blogs about the automation, wireless, you know, routing switching. So it's about the community, really. That's great. That's great. Um, so one thing I wanted to dive into is we've talked about different things to learn to get started in this area, right? Python, Go, you know, language of choice, Ying, RESTConf, NetConf, the different API sets for DNA Center, ACI, iOS XE, like all the platforms. Um, but is there something that shows up in this toolkit of starting to do network automation that people might not think about that they need to learn that's maybe a little bit surprising? Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. And you know, a lot of what I'm seeing right now, and kind of touched upon it already, you know, a lot of folks right now, when they first jump in, mention Python or Ansible. And so they'll write you know, some Python scripts or Ansible playbooks, and then the ne next question is, where, do you, where could you store those? Mm -hmm. Because if your peer makes an edit of those files, it's not tracked on, on a general server. You know, so the next thing might be, well, let's look at source code repositories and, and, and version control, looking at something like a GitHub or a Bitbucket as an example. So version control becomes like you know a skill in the periphery to be cognizant of you know as teams start collaborating together and it, you know from there it kind of expands you know pretty fast meaning 
when you make a change to a YAML file or a playbook or a script, you know, how do you prove your change isn't going to break something? You know, kind of dovetail into maybe um, test tools. You know, it could be a Jenkins or a Travis CI that's going to automatically run your tests when you try to you know, push a change or merge a change into a Git repository. And then you know, it could be next one could be something like a Docker container where how do you, how do you prove or how do you make it easy that another network engineer on your team can run the same Python application that you wrote? Typically, we'll you know, app get install here, or we'll you know, pip install here on our, on our personal machine. Then the, your peer now has to do the same exact thing. Right? So it becomes, it becomes you know, just uh, you know, logical to say, well, how, do, how can you rebuild your development and test environment maybe with a Vagrant or a Docker? So I think usually people are always talking about config ma management first. You know, it could yeah. be Python, a scripting, and Ansible. But as soon as you start collaborating internally with an enterprise, it really starts to you know, look at version control Git or CI yeah. and Jenkins and Docker or Vagrant to rebuild environments. And so it's just kind of the snowball effect that once you make the jump, you know, then you know, things really, really start, start clicking. Yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, it's about the processes inside the company, right? You know, that's what I find the most challenging thing. Like, you know, learning the Python, it's it's that easiest step. But then the processes, as Jason mentioned about the Git, you know, in CI/CD pipelines, that's the most challenging thing. Yeah, uh, definitely. Okay, and now you're scaring me. It's again. something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's something. Don't worry, we've got resources to help. Um, you're, so, you're already there. Don't yeah, forget, yeah, you need to know this and this and this and this. Okay. <laughs> so we did find. And, you know, in um, when we started teaching network programmability and automation, and Python, and about the Cisco platforms, um, we were teaching all that. And then within DevNet, we found we we added training and labs on how to use Git. You yeah. know, and so that be that does become kind of a yeah. fundamental, like you said, accompanying skill that that works on versioning your code. Yeah. I, I think another skill that we maybe take for granted, and I don't know about y you guys, is really just basic Linux. I mean, you yeah, were whipping off, yeah. you know, <laughs> like apt get and you know pip install, and I mean, I don't know. Do you guys? Does everyone feel like Linux is a is a like be skill you have under your belt? You can write some shell scripts. So this audience, nice. yes, maybe is extraordinary, but I talk to yeah. plenty of groups of engineers who, you know, even some of our Cisco SEs that I'm running a lab for them that's all Linux based, and they're like, what is this CD yeah. thing? And yeah. I, it's like. You know, it's yeah. it's um, that sort of suggests to me that you know for some folks it depends on where yeah. you're going to begin, yeah. where and for start. some people yeah. Yeah, like yeah. it's it's yeah. Linux, and some yeah. people it's like okay, I got yeah. that, I would I'm totally ready for Git. I would even add to that that sometimes just getting all of the uh, dev environment tools installed on your machine, whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever, is a a barrier in of itself. And um, so we've spent a lot of time actually writing like really great directions to get kind of those cornerstone tools put together because it is it is it can be a complete barrier. Yeah. Can I have one more? Yeah, yeah, you can have one more. And then one I got another fun question. Cool. So. One more non-tools related is documentation. Oh, yeah. Right, you can't automate what you don't know. Yeah. And what we see so much, especially with firewalls, actually, in the security space is... Oh, sure, you know, you, yeah, you know, yeah. firewalls. <laughs> no silence. Security's fault. Automating, yeah. <laughs> automating firewall changes is one of the top ones because you know, it's just rapidly deploying applications to make a change to a firewall. And then we'll usually ask, well, you know, what is your you know, process for you know, building a policy, let's say, or editing an object group? And here you have groups over here, duplicate addresses here, or they might have a rule to say if three, if three tuples of a five tuple match, then add to the policy. And you know, we'll get responses. Well, most of the time, we'll just update the object group. Or most of the time, we'll do this. And you know, the truth is, we actually can't automate you know, what can't be written on paper. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Think of it as a big if-then statement. You know, if the inputs are A, B, C, D, and E, then the output policy is going to be you know, this. And that's the hardest part, I think, initially getting started. People want to jump into the tools, yeah. but you should be able to write a procedural document, method of procedures, that you can hand to an automator or yeah. a programmer, yeah. whoever it might that's be. A, and then that part is really difficult. That's a great point, and it, it kind of goes into, um, so you've got your basic toolkit of these tools that help you do automation. We've got the APIs exposed. How do you how do you think about how do you decide what to automate first, what to go after? Like, what's some of your thought process around like if someone's wanting to maybe pick up a first project in their organization, how should they go about that? I think Anyone, for anyone me, take it's, it? Yeah. it's it's picking you know the low hanging fruit and the repetitive tasks. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like when you start at a new company, 
and you know you're given read-only access to your to the network devices and you know I started at a you know company and they gave me read-only access and so the automation should be just retrieving the information first that repetitive task of you know pulling back the information about either interface stats or you know what versions you're running across your network because it didn't go for you know every week I would get asked that you know what version are we running on the XE devices what are we running on the XR we need we need to know this we've got vulnerabilities and things like that across the board so you pick out the low hanging fruit um, for the you know the readme stuff but then we moved after that moved on the big the next one that we went on we had a lot of peering at various ISPs various pops around the world and managing um, BGP peering sessions with the likes of Facebook and Google and Apple and people want to peer with you because you're you're doing well you're shifting a lot of data um, doing that can be a full-time job updating your you know who you're peering with all the IXs can be a full-time job and you want to that was one of the first sort of real projects we started to automate out quickly is being able to find out which X, um, XPs we're sort of peering with peers at, adding that peer and adding that prefix, and then the rest is down to the basic policy of the configuration. And it sounds like the, the business driver behind that was the amount of time otherwise you know, yes. invested, so that's a yeah. great place to look for where yeah. you get the gain from Absolutely. automation. I like his low hanging fruit thing. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, and that's it's, exactly, you yeah. were going to say that too? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so apparently three of us were all going to say low hanging fruit. Do you so, want to say low hanging fruit just before? Low hanging, yeah. Yeah. Low hanging yeah. fruit, okay. Yeah. So, um, and I, I do really, I mean, that's what I did with uh, the stuff that I've played with, uh -huh. is yep. uh, just because of the fact that, you know, you get that, that quick, easy thing that's kind of sort of read only, you're getting yep. the information or you're doing something very small, um, so you're not taking down the entire network um, because you don't necessarily know all that yet. Right. You know, we actually had a tickle script that we had that um, did a write erase uh, reload on all of our routers because we would do things for like three weeks and um, we learned that maybe we should save all of the things that you did because you might have hit the wrong script. So, you know, <laughs> so go with low hanging fruit first. It's not a write erase. Um, by the way, we now save all the configs before we do a write erase to a 911 directory on our FTP <laughs> server. But yeah. yeah, go for the low hanging fruit that's also not um, production impacting. Sure. Yeah, I was going to add, you know, typically, you know, what we see is like two parallel efforts start with an enterprise, meaning, you know, architectural strategy around automation, but in parallel, the quick, you know, I'll, I'll call them quick wins, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And because, you know, the truth is leadership and management want to see what their budget is, is providing value to, to do. And I definitely agree, read only is the way to start. And not that it's because it's, you know, less risk in terms of, you know, starting to automate you know, learning the tool sets, if it's, you know, Ansible, Python, Salt, NSO, you know, what have you. But, you know, I, I think a huge part of it is when you start to shift to configuring devices with automation, you actually want the read-only already built to validate, you know, what you are configuring mm -hmm. yeah. is, is accurate. Because, you know, the notion of validation and testing, yeah. you know, today we really don't do. You know, we might copy and paste some show commands into a text file, do some manual diffs or, you know, ping and trace route. But when you think about all the tests you wish you can do, like that's where you should really start all read-only testing, and then those tests will actually run, hopefully through automation, you know, pre and post uh, change. Yeah. Even yeah. even you know, automate collection of data, make a manual change, run them again after, and a you know, great way to start. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. Uh, yeah, we, so we're we're sort of like taking it to two sort of perspectives. So one is like our internal because mm -hmm. we're MSP as well. So we're obviously looking at the automation, how this can help us in driving our business be more efficient. So we took a slightly different approach in this case, uh, since we're like a quite small company, uh, we have around 200 employees, and we have a, we have a SNOG who has about 50, 60 people. So you know we know very well each other. We sort of sit down and said like, okay, so which tasks are the most sort of human error, uh, oh. you know, so, so yeah. for instance, like there were some outages which we caused because we created wrong VLANs or we allowed the wrong, wrong VLANs on the trunks. So we look at it from this, this perspective and we start like introducing automation for these tasks. With the clients, that's, that's a different perspective again. Like, you know, our perception as a partner who's entering some new client is kind of like, you know, they're taking our job. Like, you know, they're here to take our jobs as a network engineers because they're better than us. So that's usually like first panic level and then you 
tell them like, okay, I'm here to talk about the network automation, and they're like, you know, panicking even more because suddenly like you're really taking their jobs. So uh, that's where we sh usually need to prove very quickly, like, you know, what's the result. So that's that low-hanging fruit, uh, you know, just to prove the client that there is a value in it, in network automation, and just taking, you know, small steps. Yeah. Uh, Read-only, uh, small tasks, the most frequent one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I think the testing question is interesting because that's one thing that you know, uh, a long time ago when I started writing software, there wasn't great automated testing on the software side either. It was pretty like um, you know, uh, bare bones. And then with the rise of DevOps, you know, it's just gone. Um, yeah. The tooling, the capabilities, the practices, the processes around automated testing are very, very mature and super robust and useful. And um, but that is much harder to do with a network in yeah. the mix, right? Yeah. When you're talking uh, yeah. about testing code against a network. And um, I think that is an interesting place for some f future growth. You know, we have some things at Cisco like the sandbox, which yeah. kind of feeds into that. We have some other pieces, but just some thoughts on that progression. Yeah. I think it's it's pretty interesting. We talked a little bit when I was talking about how we, you know, I start, we start with the automation with the read only and then we started the deployment. What's funny about that kind of circle is, is you imagine, you know, that go full circle. But we started with the read-only, and then we went on to the configuration side via automation, but then the validation was then done via the command line. Right. Mm. Yeah. Which kind of, it seems a, a, a little bit strange, because it's almost like you don't trust that automation. So Interesting. the next stage onto that, as I found that, like, you know, take my example, when I'm adding BGP peers, I would log into the router and I would check to see if that was up. But now we have this you know, great automation tool testing, things like PyATS is a fantastic example for this, that you can build into your automation scripts through Python to have that validation done for you. So once you configure the peer, you will have your validation tool check that your configuration is correct for you, and the results that you're getting are back are correct. And if it's not, a rollback feature then should then mm. take place, and you should be able to remove that change. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, from my experience, what I'm finding the easiest sort of segment in the Cisco portfolio is the ACI because the multi-tenancy, mm -hmm. and that's where like a building the testing environments, it's 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 yeah. quite easy. Yeah. You know, you can basically software define your testing environment. What I'm finding more difficult is that compass piece. So in a compass, you know, it's 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 really hard to to sort of like a build a more. testing environment. So uh, I think yeah. there, there is still some space. I for think it. it's a place where there's a lot of opportunity, you know, for yeah. things to be figured out, for tooling, for Definitely. things like the sandbox. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, we're almost, you know, we're getting to, to near the end and I want to end with a, a future looking question for everyone sort of in terms of, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, so we've covered, I think, basic tools that you want to learn to get in your tool belt in terms of Python, APIs, object models, uh, the Cisco products, DNA Center, ACI, NSO, all the device level APIs. Like these are all sort of the building blocks to where we are. And um, it's been great to hear your stories about how you've journeyed through that and, and kind of mixed those together. But what are some of the things that you want to learn next? And what are some of the things that are kind of on that horizon of um, you, you want to tell our audience about, maybe they want to go check out, dive into, you know, um, if they're picking up a new project, what are some of the things we want to investigate like that? Uh, Shelly, you want to start? Yeah, so I think for me, um, it really is about moving up the stack and to go to higher levels of abstraction, those kind of platforms that I was talking about, you know, whether it's for configuration or for operational data. And then finally, that layer at the top that stitches it all together, right? That does the configuration and then the validation yeah. um, and that, that does that. So I, to me, I, I feel like I'm moving up the stack in the stuff that I'm learning and that I'm, I'm working on with customers. Cool. Yeah. I'd like to go into a matrix thing and, <laughs> and, and then download her knowledge. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so if great. we're if we're talking, what we want to do next? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, I I I do whatever these guys are telling me to do because they're like my trusted advisors. Um, and as you've noticed, she like is incredible with explaining things. And um, actually, I just found out recently, so I have something that I'm interested in. I just found out recently that there's an API between Splunk and Stealthwatch. Yeah. And I would actually like to, so for me, it's like that's what, that's what I, because I have a lab, yeah. right? So it's kind of like, oh, I want to I wanna do that because I want to be able to have something that um, cool. 
is that low hanging fruit or a goal. Okay, build it and submit it to DevNet Code Exchange and then yeah. everybody can so, use so your project. That's, so that's sure what that's I'm, part of the goal. next year this time, I will I will be able to tell you how I connected my stealth watch to an API Splunk. I'm going to Splunk API. Hold you to that. <laughs> no, I'm, no I'm, I'm, I've already been asking people. I'm like, what that's do I do? Where do I begin? All right, Stuart will help you. <laughs> I think um, the thing that I'm going to concentrate on most with, with, with DevNet now is moving the network engineers that have learned Python and learned the languages and Ansible and kind of start to move them up into more APIs and get into terms with being able to sort of, you know, again, we've mentioned it a little bit before, not be so afraid to dive into the APIs on a lot more of a scale. And, and you know, whether that's using the APIs through um, things like SD-WAN and DNA Center is, is really great to use. And to be able to get that abstraction back and how to be able to use that information and save on the business value level. Yeah, definitely, it's great. Jason, how about you? Yeah, up the stack is definitely where, where I'm going as well. And maybe a little bit different twist on it. It's, you know, a lot of focus around consumption models, meaning once a workflow is automated and, you know, scripts are written as an example, you know, how, how is that best to be used within an organization? Meaning, sometimes if a network engineer or an engineer, sysadmin, whoever it is, you can envision being on a Linux CLI running something or, you know, in something that's very, you know, low level. But at the same time, we look at platforms like ITSM platforms like ServiceNow, or it could be WebEx Teams, mm. the phenomenal one that we see quite a bit with ha having a chat integration to trigger a workflow. You know, so it's really thinking about the organization, knowing the culture internally, and knowing what's going to work to automate something. So it's all about higher level consumption models with understanding the best user experience to integrate with that workflow as a consumer of, of the workflow yeah. itself. And I think that can relate back to the coming together of the silos, right? Like knowing that, yeah. hey, maybe this security team is always chatting in this one WebEx team space, and if we can use the APIs to get them some information into that space where they're chatting, that's super useful, right? What we see as a lot is, is, is chat for help desk. Yeah. To be able to get visibility into campus ports. It is configured properly with the right VLAN and don't return the command of the port, but you know, it's up to us to define maybe what green, amber, red is for that port. Yeah. Right? Maybe green is right VLAN, right description, the right speed and duplex. Maybe amber is, well, you know, four out of five match as an example. So just ex exposing data to the right team is, is just one form of automation. Doing that through the right user experience yeah. is, is valuable. That's great. Yeah. Matthias, how about you? Um, again, I think like a two levels for, for me. Uh, one level is sort of like us as EMSP, so I like the integration with the bots, you know, with the open software like Grafana and all the telemetry stuff. From the from the level of the being in the, the Cisco partner, doing some sort of like a cookie cutter for the for the fabric. So since we have the automation tools and we have the APIs for SDA for ACI, we want to be able. You know, it can give us you know more, higher level of efficiency as as a partner. You know, we can cookie cutting the, basically the fabric for our clients and just copy pasting. You know what we've done somewhere else and the applications on top that? of that. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you guys all so much for being here and thank all of you for being here. There's a couple of things I wanted to call out that um, we mentioned. One of them is Code Exchange, which is a place where people like this in the community and everyone here in the community <laughs> can write code and share it with each other. So it's on GitHub, but it goes into Code Exchange and it's tagged by platform. Is it for ACI? And what language is it in? Is it Python? Is it Java? You can go on there and find those examples. And so it's you to get started, you don't have to start with a blank screen and start writing your first program. You can start with things that like these people have already written and modify them and get going from there. So that's a great um, jumping off point, a great place to start. So thank you guys all so much for being here and thank you to our panelists.